I'm Erina Sakapal. I am from FLA, sophomore, and today I am going to be a facilitator. Uh, my name is Robert Dieters. Uh, although at home and among my friends, I'm always called Bob. <laughs> I am now 96 years old. I was born in uh, 1924, and uh, I grew up in a, uh, a family. Uh, I was the oldest of the children, but very close to me in age, there were three others, and uh, another brother and two sisters. Um, my life in, uh, in, uh, as growing up was uh, more or less the, the life that everyone in that neighborhood lived. We were uh, all Catholics, and we went every, every Sunday and even more often to the church, which was about 10 minutes to walk from my house, and uh, there was a parish uh, school, an eight-year primary school, which I attended, and all of, all of my teachers were sisters. And so I grew up in an atmosphere of uh, Catholic faith, and I was baptized the very day I was born, because I was, uh, they were not sure that I would live. And so a nurse, a Catholic nurse, baptized me immediately. My education was all right in my own city. I primary school, then I went to the Jesuit high school for four years, and then entered the the university, uh, Xavier University in Cincinnati, that was my home city. And, uh, but it was wartime and uh, all of us uh, young men all had to go to military service. And in the military service, I entered uh, at 18. And uh, I volunteered because if I didn't volunteer, I would be drafted, as they say, into the service, and I wouldn't know where I would be sent. But I volunteered for the uh, a program which was uh, available. We could volunteer for it. There's a uh, officer training program, which was, uh, in my case, was conducted at the Notre Dame University in the USA, another Catholic university. Uh, but we were all military people. We had to live as military under discipline. And uh, during that time, uh, an officer came to speak to our group, and he asked, uh, it was the last year of the war. Of course, we didn't know when the war with Japan would end. It was 1945, early 1945. And uh, the officer said to all of us, we want to train more Marines who can speak and read Japanese. And so if any of you want to volunteer, please come for an interview tomorrow morning. <laughs> I had never thought of going to Japan or I never knew any Japanese. I didn't know any Japanese language or anything, but I raised my hand because I I liked language and I had studied German and Latin in high school. Uh, and I was sent to the Japanese language school of the Navy. Uh, but after four months, the war ended. Our program was to be 14 months long, but after four months it ended. And uh, I wanted already to 
enter the Jesuits, and so I asked to be uh, discharged as soon as possible, and I was, and uh, entered the Jesuits in 1946 in February, just uh, six months after the war. And as a, as a Jesuit, I uh, would meet the provincial once every year. The provincial is the superior of the region where I entered the Jesuits, which was based in Chicago, but it was the whole area of the Midwest. And uh, of course he knew that I had studied Japanese and I had also studied engineering before that, but never graduated in either subject. <clears throat> but anyway, he knew that. And at that time, right after the war, uh, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, were trying to send missionaries to Japan. And uh, in the early days of the military occupation of Japan. And so uh, I told the provincial superior that I was willing to go to Japan and I knew a little bit of Japanese. I, I had read Momotaro and Urashimatoro and so anyway, after I finished the first course of uh, first section of my training as a Jesuit, I came to Japan in 1952, and uh, from there on, I'd like to tell my story uh, later in our talk, when after I met Father Arubik. So. Okay, so first of all, I would love to, um, I would like you to tell us um, something, uh, some stories related to Father Arubik, um, like what, uh, when was the time that you guys met, uh, how many years have been together and stuff. So first of all, let me start from, um, um, can you please tell us about your encounter with Father Rupe? About my? Um, encounter. With Father Rupe? Yes. Yes. Well, as I said, I came, I was sent then to Japan in 1952. Mm -hmm. That was the year that the occupation of Japan by the Allied forces ended, and Japan became completely independent again. <laughs> and uh, so I came to uh, first to uh, study more Japanese language because my knowledge was uh, rather basic <laughs> only. And uh, after one year of language study, I came to Tokyo here to Sophia University for uh, to uh, teach for two years before I would go on to the next uh, stage of my training as a Jesuit. And uh, it was during that time that I met Father Arupe because he uh, was uh, appointed as the general superior, we call him the, in Japanese the Kankucho uh, of all, all of the Jesuits in Japan. And uh, in that capacity, I would meet him every year as all of the Jesuits do. That is our custom that uh, the superior, the provincial, we call him provincial superior, goes to all of the places where Jesuits are living and working and meets each one individually for even up to one hour of conversation and talking about his, how, what he is doing, how, how he feels about his life as a Jesuit and so forth. <clears throat> anyway, I would meet him at that visitation, as we call it, and that was my first contact with him. I was I was kind of wondering how many years do you have to spend on um, the Jesuit training itself? 
How many times? Uh, how many years do you have to spend for on oh, well, training? Oh, I see. I'm just wondering. So. Yeah. So, well, it differs a little bit with the background of the of the man who enters, mm -hmm. and uh, but I was more or less the standard, <laughs> and uh, so we have two years of novitiate. That everyone does that, mm -hmm. and then if we didn't have a philosophy training, we have. Uh, well, first of all, we have some studies in in general culture, like literature, and uh, especially literature. And also, uh, I should mention it, Latin and Greek language, which are everyone studies, at least in my time. It's and uh, then after that, we have three years of study of philosophy with some other subjects, of course, but mostly philosophy. And then we are usually sent for one, maybe two years or three years to uh, some place where Jesuits are already working. In my case, I was sent from to Sophia University, where I, I was here for two years. and. Uh, I was not yet a, a priest, not, I wasn't finished yet with my program, but that, that sort of practical experience is part of our education in the future. And so here at Sophia I taught English to freshman students uh, who at that time were just 10 years younger than I was. <laughs> and uh, I came to like them very much. And I, st I still uh, keep contact with them, and uh, although they're they're also in their 80s by now, so they can't gather every year. But they used to gather every year and invite me to join them. Then also, at the beginning of the uh, so-called FLA was not called FLA; it was called International Division. It was a, a part of the university which was not fully recognized by the uh, Ministry of Education. It was called in Japanese a bekka. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, the, the students in that international division at that time were mostly uh, military people, U.S. and Australian military people, and some and uh, rather few Japanese in that international division. So the language of teaching was English, which I could do. Uh, and uh, so I taught uh, English composition and basic uh, mathematics. And uh, even I even taught together with Professor Togawa uh, you don't know him, I think he saw, has died already. He was the German language department. Uh, I taught Japanese together with him. He would teach, there were two classes. He would teach conversation in one class, and then at the middle of the time, we would change, and I would teach, uh, well, very basic grammar because the, the students were all just beginning Japanese, so they didn't know anything. That was my... And then I went to study theology, which at that time was just beginning in Kamishakuji, near Imaku. And so I was there for four years, became a... I was ordained a priest in St. Ignatius Church in 1958. And then, then to the Philippines for one year for more of the Jesuit program there. And then, well, my story is getting very long. It should, it, met, it blends in with Father Rupe. So let's yes. put it, let's okay. stop there. Yes, thank you. I would like to ask you, um, what was your first impression of him when you first met him? Well, Father Rupe, yes. yes. About, uh, he was born in seven, 1907. 
I was born in 24, so that's, uh, you can calculate it for yourself, it's 17 years uh, yeah. difference. And of course he was the top superior, so uh, I guess I was kind of nervous <laughs> meeting him, but uh, he was, uh, from the beginning, he was very uh, easy to talk to. And in other words, it, it was very easy to imagine that you were having a friendly conversation with, with someone a little bit older but, and more experienced. That was the first impression. Um, what was your first job or like the task oh, yeah. with him? I see. Yes. Well, my first job was, um, that also involves Father Arupe because uh, every Jesuit who finishes the standard program is then sent to some place or work where Jesuits are involved. And uh, in my case, encouraged by Father Arupe, the Jesuits in Sofia, where at that time he had only three Gakubu, mm -hmm. Bum Gakubu and uh, Keza Gakubu and Ho Gakubu. Well, the Ho Gakubu was just beginning at that time. And uh, then there were high schools, there were churches, and uh, the uh, other, what would you call, social works mm -hmm. for poor people. And uh, anyway, so, it's the job of the provincial in conversation with myself to decide what area I would work in as a Jesuit. Well, because in my years of university study, which altogether would only be three and a half years uh, as a military person, uh, I had studied electrical engineering, and so my father Rupe knew that Sophia University was preparing to start a recall Gakubu. So he said, why don't you go back to your study of engineering and prepare to be a, one of the faculty of uh, the new Gakubu, new uh, uh, faculty. And so I began a program of studying engineering already, which I had been away from for more than 10 years. So I went back to the U.S. and entered the uh, undergraduate department. Well, as a graduate student, I entered the under graduate department and studied. I had to restudy in a way my engineering background. And although I had followed a little bit with mathematics. Anyway, I had to start from from the bottom. <laughs> and I, after two years I was able to finish a master's program in the US. And then I Sophia had already just begun the uh, recall Gakubu, the, the science and engineering faculty. And so I thought, well, I, I was asked to come back to Japan when I was not yet prepared to be a, a teacher in, uh, in the science and engineering faculty. So, uh, but fortunately, the uh, the department that I would enter would be electrical and electronic engineering. And the, uh, the department chairman, the Gakka Cho, was a, a, had come to Sofia right after his retirement at, at uh, Tokyo University. And so he, Tokyo University had retirement at 60 at that time. So he was still quite young and vigorous. And uh, 
So I, after I met him, he immediately said, well, two weeks from now, Tokyo University Graduate School is having an entrance examination for foreign students. And he said, I will take you and introduce you to Tokyo University and why don't you take that examination? Which I did. And uh, then, uh, well, anyway, I took the examination and there were some questions I couldn't answer. <laughs> anyway, I was interviewed by the entire faculty of the electrical engineering de department at, at uh, Tokyo University. And I was accepted, so. And, uh, well, I was admitted to the doctoral program at Tokyo University as a foreign student. And, um, well, after th three and, uh, years, I was able to graduate, and, uh, and six months later, able to present my thesis. And uh, then I was accepted as a teacher, as a Corsi, sending Corsi in, uh, in Sophia University. Uh, so, Father Arupe kind of like led you to the way to Sophia University. That's right, yes. Uh -huh. He was, afterwards when I talked more about Father Arupe, you'll understand that he was a medical student. In fact, he graduated in medicine. Uh -huh just before he entered the Jesuits. And uh, he had uh, been in the university in Madrid, Spain, and he had met professors who were atheists. They didn't believe in God, but whereas he, he did. And uh, he had the uh, strong impression that it was necessary for some uh, Catholics and Jesuits to enter the field of some field of science because many professors had no respect for religion. They, they didn't know anything about it and they despised it, if anything. Uh, and so he, he was very eager for a Jesuit who, who had some background and ability to go into that field. And that's why he uh, uh, said that he wanted to assign me to Sophia University in the Department of Science and Engineering. Uh, and eventually when I did enter into the faculty as electrical electronic engineering, there was no one else in the entire faculty who was a, a Jesuit or a Catholic even. They, they were all, uh, they weren't, uh, I don't say atheists, but they, they had no knowledge or background in, in religion or Christianity. So uh, it was, uh, from his standpoint, it was an ideal position for me to be in. He said that he was in, he was a medical student and he mm -hmm. uh, decided to leave medical studies and, uh, and then enter the Jesuits. Yes. But um, do you think he didn't hesitate in choosing the Jesuit and, and instead of um, going with the medical um, kind of path? To, to continue as a medical yes. student? Yes, because he graduated. Well, uh, let me go back just a little bit in his history. He was born into a, a, a Catholic family. His mm -hmm. father and mother and his, uh, he had five older sisters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, was, he was the last in the family and he was the only boy. <laughs> he had only sisters above him. Yeah. So I imagine, he, I didn't read about it, but I imagine he was uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, 
Oh, you say in Japanese, cry a god on it, doesn't show. But he went to a, a, a Catholic school run by the uh, Escola Pia Fathers. They're in, also in Japan. They, they have a school in Miyaken. But um, he went to their school and uh, it was uh, a, apparently a very good school. They had a good training and, and language and, and basic everything that is part of basic education. And, but they also had, at the end of, of the school day, there was always 30 minutes of study of, uh, well, what, they sh what most Catholics know about their faith and uh, how, how to pray and, and what it means to believe in God. They had always 30 minutes after the last class. And, and he uh, apparently was very, uh, uh, liked that very much. And at the age of 11, he entered the so-called uh, sodality of the, the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is, uh, in, in that case, it was a group uh, of, of students from all the schools in Bilbao, the city where he was raised. And, and also there he got uh, training and practice uh, of his religion, especially uh, one of the things he did, especially at that time, is that uh, he with the others would visit the, the very poorest people in Bilbao. And, become friends with them, try to help them, whatever way they could. But anyway, so what was the question? <laughs> oh, I said, um, he, didn't he hesitate? Oh, before, before he uh, entered the Jesuits, yes. 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 Well, he, uh, he went smoothly uh, up into medical school and finished the, uh, I'm not sure that he really finished the last year because he entered the Jesuits in Early January of uh, 19, when was it? 27. Yes. Nearly. So he would have been, he was born in January, so he was just about 21 years old at that time. And was already well, qualified as a doctor but he had never uh, actually practiced as a doctor. Yes. So, uh, but uh, for him that was no sudden decision because he already, he writes in his memoirs that already from 10 years before that, he uh, was not yet thinking about the Jesuits, but he was thinking about uh, becoming a priest, and especially in becoming a missionary. And uh, from early, from a rather early age, probably he was, must have been maybe 10 or 11 years old, perhaps, he uh, had the, uh, he, he felt that he was called to go to Japan. It's very strange because he didn't know much about Japan. Although he knew the life of uh, Francis Xavier, he had read uh, the life of Francis Xavier was at that time well known in, among Catholics, at least in Spain, and uh, certainly he knew that. Uh, so he, uh, but it was rather strange because he didn't know anything about Japan except what he had read in the, about Francis Xavier, but he. He felt interiorly that he was called to go to Japan. I find it rather strange, <laughs> but that's the way it was. Yeah. And so, as it, when he entered the Jesuits, he already had the intention, if he were sent, and he would ask to be sent to Japan, he would very gladly go. So. Uh -huh. One thing is worth mentioning is, uh, in that last year, 
before he entered the Jesuits. He and three of his sisters, they had just experienced the death of their father. The mother had died many years ago when he was a very small child, but the, the father died about that time. And uh, he and the three of his sisters went to Lourdes in southern France, where there's a famous uh, pilgrimage site to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And they stayed there for one month, uh, praying and, and uh, enjoying the atmosphere. Uh, it's a rather comfortable place. I was there briefly myself. Uh, <coughs> and um, there, because he was already a, a, a graduate of medicine, he was permitted, or perhaps even invited, to take part in the uh, in an office of, in Lourdes, which investigates so-called miracles which occur there. Frequently, especially sick people, well, even psychologically sick people, often find a, a great change in their life and there. And especially those which are physical, the, uh, Miracles, we call them. Uh, people who have a, a long-term disease of some kind, or even a deformity, like even a broken bone or something, uh, frequently are healed rather suddenly, you know, just within a few days or so. And uh, But there is an office there which in which there are uh, doctors, medical people, some of them are not uh, Catholic believers at all, but they uh, examined people who say that they were suddenly cured of some disease or some defect, deformity, and uh, he was invited to uh, participate in their investigations of such cases. And so he, he says in his memoirs that there were three different, what, he would, what we usually call miracles because they occurred suddenly without any medical explanation. So he was per permitted to be uh, participate in the examination because they, uh, first of all, they well, they, I don't want to go into the examination they make, but they do try as much as possible to certify that this was, this happened as a result of their, well, as a result, at least it happened after they prayed and it has no medical, adequate medical explanation. And they would call that a miracle. But they were always examined carefully they didn't want people to uh, to use their imagination uh, or something to to say that they were healed. Anyway, that was one of his experiences, which contributed to his desire to uh, become a priest to enter the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. I feel like even after he entered Jesuit, he still have been has been have been using his knowledge related to medical, even though, um, after I heard, even after I heard the story about the um, miracle, because I also have heard that he um, was helping people at the hospital in Japan during the war. That's right, and, yes. Yes, and I, when I heard the story, I felt kind of, um, I, I don't know, I was kind of moved because I, even though he, uh, um, uh, he, he did his best to help other people, even though it's not, it, they were not like Christian or anything. He yes, just did what he could have done, uh, yeah. he could do yes. the best. So that's kind of moving for me. Um, another question. That, can, that uh, especially at the time of the atom bomb. Yes. Yeah. 
he, he was in Hiroshima, but not in the center of Hiroshima. Yeah. And so uh, he was not physically injured by the bomb, although the house he was living in was damaged. Mm -hmm. But that's another story. I, if we have time, I'd like to talk about that. Thank you.